Whenever we pray, we are letting God be God. That might sound like a strange statement because God has always been God. He is God and He's always going to be God. He created the universe and everything in it. He's our creator. He's the one who sustains us. And how could you stop God from being God? Well, He's always going to be God. But God has chosen to relate to us and according to some contingencies, and especially when we pray. God has chosen that He's going to do this or He's going to refrain from doing that. Whenever we do this or when we don't do that, that becomes especially clear in prayer. Now, it's the truth as I read the Bible, and I'm, I'm abundantly assured of it, that God loves to answer prayer. But because of these contingencies that God has related to some of our, or to our prayers, sometimes we are the reason that God's not answering our prayers the way that we would like Him to. But I'm convinced He wants to answer our prayers. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18, it tells us, therefore, that Christ had to be made like His brothers in every respect so that He might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because He Himself has suffered when tempted, He's able to help those who are being tempted. Jesus was tempted to sin, but He never sinned. And he became that sacrifice that we remembered in the Lord's Supper. He became the propitiation for our sins and was able to do that because he was sinless himself. But the Bible said there because he's been tempted, well, we can be sure that he knows what it's like and he wants to help us when we're tempted page over in my Bible, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, it says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Let us, let us, the the writer said there, twice. And he ended by saying, let us draw near. God is inviting us in. He wants us to come to him and find grace and mercy in our time of need. And he assures us that that's what we get in Jesus Christ. So then why sometimes does it seem that we're not getting the grace and mercy we need that we're praying for. Why does it seem that some of our prayers go unanswered? Well, there are many, many reasons, but as the old saying goes, some prayers get no higher than the ceiling. Most of our homes have eight-foot ceilings, so that's why I've titled this Eight-Foot Prayers. It has nothing to do with the length of the prayer, but, but how high they go. We want our prayers to go straight to the heart of God. But God tells us sometimes there could be things about us that keep them from ever getting there. So we're going to think about six reasons that our prayers might not, might not be answered this morning, and each one of them has something to do with us. In the first place, God might not answer your prayer because of sustained sin in your life. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 12 says, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Some people have God's rapt attention. Some people have God's ear all the time. Who are those people? Peter says they're the righteous. Now, that doesn't mean that they're perfect people. It doesn't mean that they are people without sin because there's not one. Jesus was the only one. The Bible tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. The Bible tells us we make God out to be a liar if we say we have no sin. So that's not what being righteous is about in this passage. 
But a person who is practicing sin habitually, willy-nilly, no effort made to to get a, a handle on it with God's help, the Bible says in the other half of that verse then that the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Sometimes prayers are not answered because sin is so present in a person's life because he or she is willing for it to be that way. Back in the Old Testament, Isaiah memorably told God's chosen people Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, or his ear dull that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Isaiah had this message for God's people. There was a lot of hope in it, but there was a lot of warning and challenge. And your prayers are not being answered, he said, because of the sin that's standing between you and God. And that would only be sin of which they were unwilling to repent. Proverbs chapter 28 verse 9 makes the point similarly. If one turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Now, when we think about prayer and we think about uh, how eager God is to answer prayer and all those assurances given in the Bible... Uh, we might think God is always happy to hear somebody pray, no matter who it is. But the wise man says, when someone turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And that's that big word that you find in the Old Testament for things God hates. He doesn't want any of it. It'd be like when, when we taste something that we, uh, we don't like and we just immediately want to spit it out. We're happy to have uh, company from Jessica's family from Washington State with us. And last night she introduced our family to asparagus. Well, there's, there's a reason why I had never even tried asparagus. But it wasn't so bad. We really liked it, Aunt Velma. We really did. Um, but if not... A word to describe would be abomination. I don't ever want that in my mouth again. Some people's prayers are an abomination to God. But for no other reason that they turn their ears aside from hearing His law. Now that certainly sounds like that's someone who's in open rebellion to God. I will not listen to you. But I don't even want to slip that way by being somebody who's not reading my Bible who's not listening when the Word of God is preached, who's not not participating in in Bible class, turning an ear aside from hearing His law. We don't want to go there. Sin sustained in our life will keep our prayers from getting to the heart of God. Another thing that will keep our, our prayers from being answered is our own floundering faith. Would you read with me from James chapter 1, verses 5 through 8? And we're only going to to stick here for just a little while and look at this a little more deeply next week in our last lesson about prayer. James chapter 1, verse 5. The brother of our Lord says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. But let him ask in faith, with no doubting, For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that's driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Now, just on the surface of this passage, we see in verse 5 that God really wants to bless people with wisdom. Ask Him for it, and He will give it to you. But you ask Him in faith. You ask Him without doubting. Because doubt, whenever we pray, renders them ineffective. Makes us double-minded, unstable, and we ought not to expect to receive anything from the Lord. The Bible says in verse 7. Now, I feel like this passage is directly connected to the few verses before it where... James is talking about the kind of things that we come upon in life that are are unwelcome, 
We wish they weren't here, but it's a good thing that they are. God can do something good. He says in verses 2 through 4, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's right then that James says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. So, wisdom, it would seem especially about what would God have me to do during this trying time? What would he have me to learn? What would he have me to to do going forward? How shall I proceed? I need wisdom. And so we pray about that, and in concert with the things he's told us in the Bible, uh, we get something good. Life throws knuckleballs, someone said at us. That's what verses 2 through 4 is about. I read that uh, Bobby Mercer, some of you know who Bobby Mercer was. Late Bobby Mercer was both a a New York Yankee and a brother in Christ. It doesn't seem like those two go together to me, but they do in the case of Bobby Mercer. Bobby said that uh, trying to hit a knuckleball is like trying to eat jello with chopsticks. And sometimes we encounter things in life, life's throwing us knuckleballs, and we it's like trying to eat jello with chopsticks. But there's wisdom from God to help us handle those things. We rob ourselves of it, though, if our faith is floundering when we pray. Can God really help me with this? Will God really help me with this? God doesn't want us to be thinking that way when we pray. Now, again, we're going to talk more about that next week. But that's another reason some of our prayers go no higher than the ceiling. And then in the third place, sometimes our prayers are not answered because when we're praying them, our pride is just being pronounced verbally. Turn with me to Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Many of you will remember the way that Jesus taught this truth with a parable. Luke Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, kept praying thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but kept beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. I would think that most often people that are really, really proud of themselves wouldn't even bother to pray. But Jesus knows people better. And he could tell about a Pharisee who went up to the temple to pray. When he prayed, he had no praise for God. He had no request to make. He was very full of himself, but his prayer made no difference. He's very different from that tax collector. The kind of of person whose prayer that a Pharisee would have thought God would probably never hear, never respond to. All he could do was, was beat his breast continually and say, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. Which one went to his house justified, said Jesus. It's the one who came to God humbly. It's the one who knew he had needs before God. The one who knew that that God couldn't get all he deserves out of a person. The Pharisee was so proud of himself. There's really no need for God indicated in his prayer. Pride will get in the way of God's willingness to answer our prayer. Related to that, over in James chapter 4, verse 3, sometimes prayers are just covetousness communicated to God. James said, you ask and do not receive. Why? 
because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. That's James chapter 4, verse 3. There are some things that we don't receive when we pray, and the reason is the reason we're asking for them. It comes from selfishness. It comes from our passions. It's about having things and and doing things that don't lead us closer to God, but might in fact lead us further away from God. You ask wrongly, he said. When we're asking God for the things that we're asking Him, are we thinking about what will honor Him, what will glorify Him, and what will please Him? Are we thinking about things that will help other people, that would help you to serve other people? I wonder if we spent the next week writing down everything that we prayed how much of what we prayed would be about other people and how much of it would be about ourselves. Now, we need to be praying to God to ask Him to do in our lives what only He can do, what we can't do without His help. But our prayers ought not to be totally self-centered. Asking things so that we can only use them for our own pleasure. Well, if we didn't have a satellite TV now, sometimes I find myself up late at night and TV's away to help me drift off to sleep. But things would be like they used to be uh, when we were just using rabbit ears out there off of Gateway Drive and picking up the channels from Joplin and Pittsburgh. And, and sometimes at night, especially on a Sunday night, uh, not much to watch except the televangelists. And I wonder if uh, many of the televangelists have ever read their Bibles all the way to James chapter 4, verse 3. What are we praying about? Why are we praying about that? What does God want to give us, and why does He want to give it to us? Our prayers ought not to be just our covetousness communicated. They, they keep those prayers from going any higher than the sea. Here's a really important one. A big challenge to some of us. One reason that our prayers aren't getting to the heart of God is because of relationships that have gone wrong. And they're still there when maybe I could do something about it. You'll remember Jesus talking about that in Matthew chapter 6 when he had just taught people a, a simple way to pray, what many people call the Lord's Prayer, but it's the prayer the Lord gave to his disciples in that day. But after he told them about how to pray, and part of that prayer was asking God to forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgive me of my sins as I forgive other people. An invitation to God to be just as forgiving with me as I am with other people. Jesus brings the point home and brings it hard when he says in verses 14 and 15, For if you forgive others their trespasses your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Now we might wish somewhere in those two verses Jesus had put an except or but or something like that. But he didn't. When relationships have gone wrong with people and we're not willing to do what we can about it, the relationship has gone wrong with God. And if I'm unwilling to be forgiving of another person, how is God going to forgive me? It's not going to happen. Why don't we take a break for just a minute and... uh... You don't need a break? Okay, we'll keep going. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7, uh, bears a relation to this at home. Here Peter's been talking about uh, relationships of marriage, a husband and a wife. And he's been talking to wives first who don't have uh, a believing husband. They have an unbelieving husband. Here's how you ought to live with him. 
Then he turns to husbands in verse 7 of 1 Peter 3, and he says, Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So it's husband and wife relationship. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way. Dwell with her according to knowledge. It's husband and wife relationship. But before Peter has ended what he says in that verse, he says that your prayers may not be hindered. Now that could mean one of two things. It might encompass both things. But it could be that being at odds with your spouse all the time is going to keep you too agitated to be praying to God at all, and your your prayers would be hindered. Or it could be the kind of application of what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 6, 14, and 15, that if you two aren't willing to get along, especially you as the husband not doing your part, then your prayers are going to be hindered in reaching the throne of God. The word there for hindered, and and often when you read the word hindered in the New Testament, is from the Greek word enkopto. And that was used sometimes in the first century writings when someone was talking about what happened in a war. And sometimes an army would cut a big ditch through a road to make it impassable. Nobody's getting past here. And that's the picture here. You dwell with each other. In an understanding way, you think of each other's needs and wants and all, or there's a roadblock between the words of your prayer and the ears of God. We wouldn't want it to be that way, but the Bible says it could be. That could be a reason that God's not responding the way we would want to our prayers. This last one is really the most fundamental one. Some prayers go no higher than the ceiling because access has not been authorized for the person who's praying. Now, what does that mean? John chapter 9, verse 31, some people put into words what's generally true, biblically speaking. God does not hear a sinner. God does not listen to a sinner. Now, that's a person who sins outside of a relationship with God. Now, the person who said it in John chapter 9 was not an inspired spokesman for God. It was that man who had, uh, who had been born blind. And Jesus healed this grown man instantly of his blindness. And that kicks off a big controversy then in the rest of the chapter with the people who didn't like Jesus. Well, who is he? Who can do something like that? And this man whose sight was restored grows in confidence all the way through the chapter and and what he thinks about Jesus. But it's at this one point when he says, uh, God doesn't listen to sinners. God doesn't hear sinners. This man is not a sinner. Otherwise, this wouldn't have happened. God wouldn't have worked with him to make this happen. Well, again, he's not God's inspired spokesman, but he's saying the kind of things like the Bible says. The things like we were looking at in in chapter 1. Now, you might be somebody like Cornelius. I said that what that man said was generally true, biblically speaking. But Cornelius, we meet in Acts chapter 10, and by everyone's account who knew him, this is a good, good man. And in about verse 4 of Acts chapter 10, he is told... By God's messenger, your prayers have come up as a memorial before God. Now, when Peter's retelling the story in Acts chapter 11 of what happened in Acts chapter 10, he said that Cornelius was told, Acts 11 verse 14, that Peter will bring you a message by which you may be saved. Peter would come and preach to him the gospel. And until he had heard that gospel and believed that gospel and obeyed that gospel, he wasn't saved. Now, God can answer anybody's prayers he wants. I'm not going to tell God what to do. But the assurance is given to the person who's saved. The assurance is given to the person who's in Christ. 
And God could have answered one or a thousand of Cornelius' prayers, and in the end it wouldn't matter if Cornelius wasn't saved from his sins. So Peter brought that message, and he had told Cornelius in Acts chapter 10 and verse 43 that whoever believes on the Lord Jesus can have forgiveness of sins. Well, hearing that message and getting a little more, then in verse 48, the Bible says he commanded them to be baptized. And they were. Same message that Peter preached in Acts chapter 2, that people need to believe in Jesus as Lord and Christ. He was crucified for our sins. He was buried and he rose from the dead, according to the Scriptures. And he reigns. He alone can save. The people who heard that message in Acts chapter 2 were cut to the heart. Cornelius and his household were cut to the heart. But those people in Acts chapter 2 said, well, what shall we do? Peter answered, verse 38, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So that's what 3,000 did that day. That's what Cornelius and his household did in Acts chapter 10. When those people were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins, they were baptized into Christ. Now, how important is that? Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 teaches us that every spiritual blessing, we have it in the heavenly places in Christ. All the good things that God wants to give, ultimately, all the best things that there are for a person to have, are in Christ. That would include the assurance that God is attentive to our prayers, that God is answering our prayers continually. Well, I want to be in Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27, the Bible says, For you're all sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. That's how I get into Christ. Faith leads me to be baptized into Christ. Then, Paul said in that text, I'm a child of God. Now, what parent, loving parent, doesn't want to give their child all the best? Everything within their power. God's that way. All the spiritual blessings are in Christ. So I want to be in Christ, don't you? Well, that's it for this morning. Six reasons that I might be keeping God from answering my prayer. There's no reason it should keep being that way. Now, you can't take this list and review it and find the reason that any particular prayer has gone unanswered. There are other reasons why God doesn't answer some prayers. That's not our subject for study this morning. But just think about what life is and life with God is when it's the opposite of this list. When yours is a holy life, when you're full of confidence in God and you live humbly and you approach Him humbly, when your prayers are about what will glorify Him and and what will help other people, whenever you, as God wants it to be, are enjoying good relationships with other people, and whenever you're living this life as His child, knowing it's a good life and it only gets better in the next, well, that's a great life. Uh, That's a life where... Prayers are getting through. They're going right to the heart of God who provides grace and mercy in our time of need. So I'll just end by asking you this morning if if you're in Christ and are you living faithfully with Christ and giving God every opportunity to be as good to you as He wants to be? If not, then, then why shouldn't this be the day Why shouldn't this be the day that you're baptized into Christ and become the heir of every spiritual blessing? And remember what's on the flip side of that. 1 Peter 3, verse 12, the 
eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are attentive to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. You see, God counts us as righteous or unrighteous. As righteous or evil. We're saved or we're lost. And sometimes I think people feel justifiably that they're living with the face of God against them today. They realize wrongs uh, that have them in this situation, wrongs of their own. That's one thing. But what about to see him on judgment day with his face against you? And then to suffer an eternity, that's the outcome of that. There's no need for it to be that way. Not when you have a God like we have, who loves like He loves, who's done what He's done in Christ to save you and wants to bless you with every spiritual blessing. If you're ready to come to Christ, we're encouraging you to do it and asking you to come while we stand and sing together.